Houses illustrated in this bulletin are designed to meet the great demand of the low income groups. This chart shows that 70% of all personal incomes in this country range from $500 to $2,000 annually. Faced with the problem of producing for these groups, the automobile industry secured the finest engineers and through highly developed production and financing made car ownership possible to the great mass of wage earners. Architects are busy making plans of small homes using the principles as described and illustrated in bulletin number four. The following pictures taken from this bulletin show the schemes used to develop the plans from which the three houses in Maryland were built. This is house B, a one-story and basement structure. The arrangement of its rooms assures livability and privacy with a minimum of hall space. The plan also lends itself to various styles of architectural treatment and the use of different materials. This is a perspective of house D, two stories and basement, with living quarters situated at the rear to meet the modern trend in home planning, simple and compact with ample closets and good wall space for furniture. Its room arrangement permits an attractive rear yard development, as has been suggested in this plot plan reproduced from bulletin number four. This is house E, a most economical design in which three bedrooms have been provided. The plan lends itself to such changes as will permit a built-in garage or a utility room on the first floor when a basement is not desired. Here is a model of a desirable community development. The community must be well planned and free of blight. Technical bulletin number five gives valuable information on this subject. These houses indicate the character of the neighborhood in which the B, D and E houses were built. A difficult problem in home building is location on the property. Consideration must be given to grades, the development of the property, and its relationship to adjoining properties. The architect is best qualified for this task and should be present when staking out and floor elevations are determined. Firm bearing soils should be used for footings upon which foundation walls should rest. The first floor platform of House D. Although this platform is of wood frame, other types of floor construction are possible. Here studs are being carefully located to conform to standard spacing and provide for wall openings, thus permitting the application of wall materials of stock sizes, thereby avoiding unnecessary labor in cutting. After studs have been definitely located, the ribbon for sustaining the joist of the second floor is inserted and securely nailed. Raising the side frames is the next step in the construction of the house. The frames are securely nailed to the sill and, when possible, to the floor joists. The frames should then be plumbed and braced before second floor joists or end frames are put in place. In order to effect the greatest degree of economy, frame walls should be designed to permit the use of studs of stock lengths. Although the end frame does not carry the load, as can be seen in this picture, it must nevertheless be plumbed and braced in order that side frames receive the necessary rigidity. While this is being done, temporary bracing must remain in place. This picture shows the method by which openings in the exterior wall should be framed. Studs should be doubled on sides and at top in a manner which will adequately sustain the loads and prevent any bearing whatever on the window or door frames. You will note how the double two by fours acting as a lintel bear on the inner studs which have been cut for that purpose. The outer studs carry through. These lintel members must be increased in size wherever large spans occur. Houses more than one story in height should have diagonal sheathing sloping downward from the corner toward the center, assuring structural soundness and adequate bracing against wind loads. Openings in floor construction for chimney passage should be framed in this manner. Cross bridging should be provided in all floors where joists are more than eight feet long. Openings between studs should be closed wherever found in attic, over sills and girders in basement or unexcavated spaces. This is called fire stopping. It also adds to the insulation value of the wall construction. 
Note in this picture how the corner studs have been located to ensure adequate bearing in both directions for lath and other wall materials. Inspection of roof rafters is essential to assure selection of only plumb and true pieces. Care should be taken in the cutting of rafters to obtain even bearing on wall plates and ridge poles. Whenever possible, stock lengths of material should be selected which not only provide for an adequate pitch but assure attractive designs architecturally. Although a ridge pole is not always used, its incorporation into the roof structure is advisable. When properly set and leveled, it forms a line to which the rafters can be applied. This assures even bearing for the shingle lath or sheathing. In the design of these houses, the architect chose to extend the rafters beyond the wall plate to form a backing on which the cornice could be applied. Although this method is common practice, rafters are sometimes cut at the outside line of plate. In such instances, cornices are applied to lookouts, the latter being of lighter material and nailed to the rafter ends. Rafters should be securely nailed to the wall plate to prevent lateral movement. Gable studs are put in place and made fast to verge rafters. This picture shows the construction of the underside of roof ridge with ridge pole, rafters, sheathing and collar beams all in place. The latter ensure vertical loading on bearing walls and prevent walls from spreading. Upon delivery to the site, all frames should be primed and then protected with a waterproof material to prevent warpage or damage due to variable weather conditions. Warped frames make the fitting of doors and sash difficult. After building paper or other insulating material has been applied to rough openings, the frames are installed. Care should be taken to make them level by adequate blocking under sill before nailing. The frames should be of materials best fitted to resist the elements and as free as possible of knots. All exterior frames should be rabbited to receive shutters or screens with ample projection of the sill to allow for drip. Here you see the carpenter inspecting shingles to assure himself that they are of edge grain and of a quality which will ensure durability when properly applied. Various methods are used when laying shingles. In this picture, you will note the use of sheathing upon which building paper has been applied before shingles are laid. Shingle lath may also be used in lieu of solid boarding where damp weather or lack of under roof ventilation may cause deterioration. To make chimneys fire safe, they should be lined with regulation tile flue lining. Each joint should be carefully filled and pointed with mortar. Air spaces should separate chimney from frame construction. All chimneys or other masonry work should be properly flashed at roof intersections. The use of non-corrosive materials as well as the best known methods for its application should be employed to ensure against leaks. The flashings should be let well into the masonry joints and amply extended under shingles. Flashings should not be confined only to chimneys at roof intersections but used in all places on exterior surfaces where water may penetrate. One of the most difficult pieces of work in the construction of a house is that of stair building. Treads and risers should be joined to each other by the tongue and groove method and supported by stringers located at sides and center. Stringers should be selected for even graining and be devoid of all knots. Wherever possible, stairs should run straight to avoid expensive and complicated framing and to eliminate stair landings. Due to the limitation of space, stair winders were necessary in these small homes. Here is a picture showing a carpenter installing the studs for an interior partition. As in the exterior frame walls, the studs in this partition should be carefully spaced to receive stock wall material such as lath, plasterboard and other interior wall finishes. Studs should be plumb and true to prevent uneven plaster surfaces and be securely toenailed at top and bottom after a level has been applied. As will be seen in this picture, the framing of a large interior wall opening does not present a real problem when it's parallel with the floor joists above. In this case, it needs only to carry the small wall load above. It does, however, become a real framing problem when the opening occurs in a bearing partition as pictured here. By careful trussing, it is possible to divert the floor load above the opening to the sides and avoid the possibility of a sagging lintel. Truss work of this character requires accurate cutting. After all members are in place, they should be securely nailed to one another to assure the proper functioning of the truss. A good grade of building paper should be applied to all exterior sheathing. Beginning at bottom, as shown in this picture, only one strip at a time need be applied until such strip is practically covered with clapboard. Each succeeding strip, however, should overlap the strip below to ensure adequate insulation against the elements. It is advisable to use lath to prevent tearing 
and hold paper in place until the finished wall surface has been applied. A good quality of siding free of knots and cracks should be used. Faucets should be provided on the exterior of all houses for garden hose. The metal shield under the faucet is one way of repelling termites. This is a picture showing the rough plumbing under bathroom floor. Notice the manner in which the pipes have been installed so as not to impair the structural soundness of the floor or wall construction. Uneven floors in bathrooms are generally the result of cutting of joists, causing, as it does, needless repairs from time to time. Economy can be affected in plumbing costs if baths are located next to or directly above kitchens. A great deal of trouble oft times occurs when plumbing fixtures have not had adequate protection against damage after delivery to the site. The expense of replacing any fixture in a small home adds an unnecessary cost which must ultimately be borne by the purchaser. Newspaper or building paper is ordinarily used on bathtubs to protect against plaster when the latter is being applied. Since all other fixtures are installed after the plaster work is completed, they are less subject to possible change. Conduits should pierce all studs at the center. Ample outlets should be provided in all rooms, as well as a sufficient number of circuits to prevent overloading. In this picture, one sees the installation of double-hung sash. If proper operation of sash is to be obtained, a good quality of seasoned material is vital. After the sash has been weighed, weights should be selected which will give proper balance. A good grade of pulleys is also an essential factor in the satisfactory operation of double-hung sash. New devices are now on the market for the operation of double-hung windows and should be of real value where mullion space is limited. The recesses in which the sash moves up and down should be oiled and not painted. Weather stripping should be installed in all exterior openings where climatic conditions warrant. In small homes, painting becomes a real problem in the cost of maintenance. It is therefore important that a good grade of paint be used which contains such basic materials as assure durability. Knots should be shellacked before the priming coat is applied to prevent discoloration of paint. Where soil conditions demand, foundation walls should be waterproofed using tile drain pipes connected to storm sewers or dry wells at level of footings. After these pipes are covered with gravel, the work of backfilling begins. Backfill should be dampened and thoroughly tamped to prevent future settlements or the formation of water pockets near foundation walls. Here is the finished grading work. Note how it slopes away from the foundation wall to prevent unsanitary conditions or the possibility of water entering basement. Laving and plastering work demands experienced workmen if a satisfactory job is to be obtained. Wood laths should be properly spaced to provide an adequate key for plaster and then nailed to studs and joists at each bearing point. Note the workmen cutting off the lath which overlaps the studs. This is not always done and naturally results in uneven wall surfaces due to the lack of a firm foundation on which to apply the plaster. About every seventh lath, the joint should be broken. This tends to give greater rigidity to the wall and will prevent in most instances continuous cracks caused from shrinkage. Where frame construction does not permit a plaster key, wire lath should be used. Metal corner beads should be applied to all outer corners to prevent damage when the room is in use. Such beads should be carefully leveled before nailing to ensure the even application of plaster. Metal laths should also be applied over hubs of soil lines wherever they project into wood lath. To ensure good results, plaster should be mixed according to manufacturer's specifications. It is essential that good, clean, sharp sand be used in the preparation of the brown mortar and that only enough water be added to make it pliable. The first or scratch coat should be applied with enough force to ensure adequate keying. A straight edge should be applied before plaster is dry. This gives a smooth base for finishing coats. Care should be taken to make coats thick enough to conform to the width of jams. 
To safeguard this operation, it is advisable to apply grounds all around rough openings which are to be plastered. The white coat should be mixed in a large tank and left for a number of days to slack. This process is often neglected when a house is being rushed with the result that a satisfactory plaster job is not always obtained. During the slacking process, the tank should be covered to keep out the rain or to prevent moisture evaporation. When the finished coat is finally ready for application, gauging should be added as required. It must be thoroughly mixed and applied immediately before it starts to set. Only experienced plasterers should apply this white coat as its application demands a skill perhaps more exacting than any other trade in the building industry. Rough flooring should be cleaned of all plaster or other materials before paper is laid to receive finished flooring. The rough floor should also be checked over to see that it's well nailed and presents a fairly even base. A heavy tar paper was used in this house and provides a good insulation for the first floor construction. After the paper has been laid, it is important to locate joists for the purpose of securely nailing the finished flooring. Nothing is more annoying than a creaking floor. Finished flooring should be tongued and grooved on all edges and be free of all knots. Door jams should be set in their respective openings after plaster is thoroughly dried. It is important that each jam be securely blocked and leveled to ensure the proper operation of doors which they are to receive. Whenever possible, jams should be rabbited to receive door stops, although economy generally permits only the surface type. The head jam should be mortised to receive side jams to ensure against lateral movements which tend to prevent freedom of door action. Only expert workmen should apply interior trim. Each piece should be carefully fitted and securely nailed. Trim should never be applied until plaster work is thoroughly dry, otherwise warping is apt to occur. All joints should be mitered or butted, whichever method produces the most practical results for the particular molding being used. This does not mean, however, that each workman should be allowed to choose the style which best suits his fancy. On the contrary, one method should be selected by the head carpenter and be consistently used throughout. All cabinet work should be carefully fitted to plaster work either by scrabbing or by the use of a back molding. In the application of base moldings, it is advisable to secure the base floor molding to the subfloor rather than to the base itself. This permits shrinkage of wall and floor to act independently of each other and at the same time keeping a well-fitted base. The fitting and hanging of doors consists principally of applying hardware in such manner as will ensure proper swinging, latching and locking. Care should be taken to mortise the hinges, locks and strikes as their design may require. Wherever possible, doors should be hung to swing back against walls at right angles. Door bumpers should be provided at bases to prevent doorknobs from injuring plaster. It is essential that doors be fitted snugly against their stops to prevent rattling when in a closed position. When saddles are not used, it is desirable to allow plenty of room between the bottom of the door and the floor to permit it to swing freely over floor coverings. Warm air systems were selected for heating these three small homes. Their installation required considerable study as the necessary duct work created problems in partition and wall framing, which should be planned in advance of any construction work to reduce the cutting of wall plates and girders. Ducts should be carefully located, sized and pitched to allow the system to function properly. Sharp turns in ducts, which cut down the flow of air, should be avoided wherever possible. Furnace sizes should be checked to assure economy in fuel consumption. The various schemes in decorating one's home always create an interesting problem. In this house, the buyer chose a light-colored wallpaper with a small figure design. This tends to give small rooms greater scale. All color schemes in decoration work should be simple and harmonious. Perhaps the last principal work to be done in a house is the sanding and finishing of floors. After the sanding process has been completed and all dust has been carefully wiped from the floor, a filler is applied. It may contain stain or be clear as the buyer chooses. Wax, varnish, or shellac is then used. 
A coat or two of wax over varnish or shellac will add much to life of the floor finish. Linoleum floors should be waxed and kept as free of water as possible, using only a damp cloth for cleaning purposes. At last the houses are finished and moving day arrives. What a thrill for these new homeowners to be sheltered under their own roof and no longer be members of that great army of rent payers. Here are a few views of the interiors of these small homes. Note the ample wall surfaces providing suitable space for furniture. The kitchens are planned for efficiency with adequate space for refrigerators, ranges and closets. Cross circulation of air and abundant light makes work in this kitchen a joy. Here's a breakfast nook finished in veneered paneling. And this is the bathroom in house D. The same house has this attractive bedroom with light and ventilation on three sides. Public interest in these small homes was keen. More than 300 people tried to purchase them, proving the existence of a market far greater than had been expected. This chart gives a complete picture of all costs as well as the estimates published in bulletin number four by the Federal Housing Administration. The cost of house B, including a basement, was estimated at $2,500. The actual cost amounted to $2,463, a difference of $37. House D, including basement, was estimated in bulletin number four at $2,450. The actual cost came to $2,466, a difference of $16. Likewise, House E, with a basement, was estimated at $2,900, whereas the actual cost amounted to $2,869, a difference of $31. This chart gives a complete breakdown of costs on House B. It might be well to mention at this point that all materials selected for these houses were of standard quality, and their incorporation into the houses were according to the best accepted methods known to the locality. How, then, were these homes built at such low costs? The answer is only through careful designing and planning, the utilization of stock materials in standard sizes, and avoidance of waste both in labor and materials. Builders influenced by and using the principles outlined in bulletin number four have erected these small homes. Some of them are being paid for in monthly installments as low as $19